Uh, welcome, everybody. As Ellie said, uh, we are really excited because this week we're going to be reflecting on improvising and adapting in this time of uh, physical distancing. And we've asked the Reverend Suzanne Smith and Ed Carrot of Grace Episcopal in Alvin to join us for this conversation. Welcome, friends. We're so glad that you were able to join us. Um, just as a reminder, friends, the Mission AMP team has come up with some uh, further reflection questions for congregations. And those and any other notes or links from these conversations will be available at epicenter.org slash virtual dash church, epicenter.org slash virtual church. So go take a look at those when you have a moment, uh, but let's start with prayer today. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Oh God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Acts. The God who made the world and everything in it, he, is who, he who is Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, again, thanks to Suzanne and Ed for, for joining us today. We're really excited to have this conversation with you all. Could you, before we go any further, could you just uh, introduce yourselves, tell us a, just a brief uh, biography of, of you, and then um, we've got some questions we'd love to ask you guys. Suzanne, would you kick us off? Certainly. Um, hello, um, I'm the Reverend Suzanne Smith. I am the priest in charge at Grace Episcopal Church in Alvin. I have been here not quite two years. I was placed here as a deacon in charge. Grace had been without a priest for a number of years. They had an interim rector, but did not have a permanent priest for a number of years. Um, instead of electing to do, um, to be a curate under a rector, I decided to go ahead and dive in and be a deacon in charge of a parish. I inherited a church that, um, needed a lot of love and attention and uh, somebody to lead her and to lead her well. And so that's what I've set about doing for um, the past couple of years anyway. It's been a tremendous gift to watch um, a church be resurrected in many ways and to see that happen on our campus on a weekly basis. It's just been a wonderful, wonderful experience. Awesome. Thank you. Ed, how about you? Okay, well, I'm Ed Caret, and I've uh, been here at Grace for uh, almost nine, 10 months in September last year. Um, I originally started my, uh, my journey in outreach at St. Andrews in Pearland. And um, uh, at some point last year, um, uh, Suzanne invited me to, Suzanne and, and the vestry invited me to, to come and help with outreach and community missioning here, here at Grace. Awesome. Uh, before we get started, Stephanie's going to be kicking us off with the questions for the two of you. Um, but I want to invite everybody that is watching this on Facebook Live, if you have questions or comments, please leave those in the chat. And uh, Luz Gutierrez, who's here with us, is will uh, let us know um, what your questions are or your comments, and we will try to respond to those um, as long as we have time. So, uh, Stephanie, you want to kick us off? Yeah, so Suzanne Ed Gray Salmon has been operating a mobile food pantry during this time of so social distancing, but you haven't, you've done it for some time. So um, can you guys tell us the story of how that got started? I know you started very small um, with your, with your mobile food box. So can you tell us a little about how that started? 
So um, when I arrived, um, there was what is called a blessing box right outside of our sanctuary door. Um, the food insecurity in Alvin is quite high, and this was Grace's way of helping to meet that need. It's an interesting experience having an office right across the street from a blessing box, I must say. There have been lots of times I wish I had a video camera to videotape the day in the life of a blessing box because we have and see all kinds of things, let me tell you. Um, it's interesting how people come. They make their way on foot, skateboard, bikes, um, cars, motorcycles, it's just incredible. And w the one trend that we recognized was no matter what we put in the box, it always was emptied out every single day. And it just seemed to be a constant turnover of um, need, honestly, in that we could not keep up with the need that was there. And um, we have some very committed members of our congregation who would, I know one lady basically would tithe off of her grocery bill and every single week she would come and bring her tithe offerings and place it in the blessing box because her heart is so moved to help those who are hungry. Um, we have a number of folks like that in our congregation, but we found that we could not really keep up with the need um, the food need that's in Alvin. So um, when Ed brought to me the idea of venturing out and doing on a, doing this, giving away food on a much larger scale, my only answer to him was yes. I mean, we have to do this because we already knew from our little blessing box outside of our sanctuary that the need was there. And I had no doubt in my mind that if it was just um, a bigger scale in which to give food away, that it would be a success. And it certainly has been that. Ed, do you have any other thing to say about that? No, in fact, I would just, well, yeah, I do have. <laughs> so there, it's not just our blessing box, but there's a network of about seven boxes. There's actually a refrigerator that's um, set up outside a mobile uh, vehicle detailing business. They, they, they put a electricity on a pole, they plug in a refrigerator, and we had some milk left over last week from our mobile food pantry. And we actually went over and in that box, but there's seven of them and they're all constantly being emptied out. So yeah, it, it definitely was, uh, you know, we said, well, can we think a little bit bigger than just these little boxes? And that's uh, when um, a friend of mine who has another uh, organization called Manville Community Outreach um, actually had a Houston Food Bank mobile pantry partnership, an official mobile pantry partnership. And we, we all discussed, Suzanne and I met with her about the possibility of Grace becoming a site. And uh, we tested it two times in December. And um, the first time we had 97 families show up and the second time we had 110 families show up. And, um, and that's when we said, well, this is this, we can obviously make this happen. It was not on a drive through basis. We just went into the parish hall and grabbed about 70 or 80 chairs and set them up in the parking lot. And then people walked through the line after the truck arrived and, and filled their bags and boxes with whatever was available. So on January 3rd uh, this year, we, we started doing this on a weekly basis. And every week, thousands to 10,000 pounds of fresh produce and and sometimes it has assorted canned goods and sometimes it even has meats like last week they were getting they had five pound bags of frozen drumsticks so um from that point on we we were serving about 200 families every single week um this is before the pandemic this is just 200 families every week so you multiply 800, uh, 800 to 1,000 people that, that we were feeding on a weekly basis. Um, so we were, uh, and we continued to, to partner with Manville Community Outreach during that time because they're the actual partner. Um, so one of the things that, that before this pandemic even happened that to keep in mind is that about 
almost 52% of the Alvin ISD students qualify under Title I for free uh, uh, breakfast and lunch. So that was, that was before the pandemic. So you can imagine middle of March, spring break hits, and all of a sudden uh, they have to go for food. Um, the school districts, the school districts are still making sandwich, uh, lunches that they can come pick up, but then you have moms and dads that are out jobs. Um, so I'm sure that it went from 50, 52% to 99% or, or something along those lines. Wow. So, uh, yeah. So what adjustments have you all had to make? since um, since we've gone into the quarantine order, stay at home order since the pandemic um, has occurred, uh, what adjustments have you made to abide by CDC's instructions for us and the Bishop's guidelines? What are the, what, what are the adjustments you've had to make in order to continue serving your neighborhood and your community as well as abide by um, those safety concerns? So one of the, the major things I just would like to explain is that our mobile food pantry pulls up into the parking lot right across the street from our church. So all of our efforts are in the shadow of our beautiful church on Lang Street. And so um, we have this wonderful parking lot that has really become the center of all of the activity on Thursday mornings. And so um, again, it's right in the shadow of our church. And so the people who come um, know that they are coming to um, a church and all of us who are gathered there um, have, you know, one mission in mind and that's to join God at work in the world. We know he's already working and we want to be a part of it. The main thing I would say that that has had to happen is to transition to the drive through method, um, meaning people stay in their cars and volunteers don't really have much interaction with folks because people come with their trunks already open or um, they come and pick up trucks and we just put the boxes of food inside the back of their pickup trucks. So for miles, when you say for miles, Ed, people are lined up. Um, we start, the, the mobile food pantry arrives at 10 and most of the time people are already in line. The first person in line gets there at about what, 6.45 or 7 a.m. So um, to receive 35 to 40 pounds of food, some of our folks are waiting in line three and a half or four hours in order to get their food. And the line is um, 200 to 300 cars long. So you imagine it snakes all over the streets in Alvin. We have um, people who are volunteering to direct traffic um, and people are waiting in their cars a really long time. What's amazing about that is that it's controlled chaos. There is no, there is no honking of horns. You know, people are not impatient. People are just patiently waiting for their turn to receive their box of food, which if you can imagine 300 cars lined up, there's a lot of potential for, you know, something to go awry. And week in and week out, we have found that people are just patiently waiting and just so thankful to receive the food offering um, from Grace. And um, it's a really cool thing to see, but it is a bit overwhelming when you walk the street and just see the cars block 20 blocks long, just nine cars deep each block. I mean, as far as the eye can see, people are waiting for food. So it's clear that the need has increased. How has the need changed? Are there are there different needs that you're seeing now with the pandemic that people are are, are there different kinds of resources they're looking for, or what what have you been your observations with any changes in what is needed? I want me to go with that. Yeah. Well, we never know from one week to the next what's going to be on that truck. <laughs> So um, we typically unload our truck and we have uh, one of our volunteers, a master at a and he's, he's, <laughs> he's, 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 he's
take a pallet of potatoes and split it up into 400 um, portions. <laughs> so, so we do that, and and you know people just take everything that we give everybody, everything that's important. Before, when we um, when we did uh, the walk up, on the in the walk up model, you know they went from item to item, and they said, oh yeah, I'll take some of that, or no, I don't care for any of that. And, and so some, sometimes people only took two or three of the things that you were offering that week. Um, in, this, in this case, I really couldn't say what are people differently because um, they're lifting 400 boxes weighing 35 to 40 pounds into people's trunks. So that hasn't been uh, a change. Um, you know, we do see some vehicles come through with two, we had to put a limit on it because of how many families could be in one vehicle because it's hard to, um, it's hard to, to fill up their cars. I'm sorry, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, you're breaking up just a little bit there, but I think we got the gist of it. I just want to say, I know Stephanie's got a question for you all, but I love the fact that when you began this this phase of of your mobile food pantry project uh, before the pandemic, that one of the first things that you did was you found community partners. You found other people that were experts in this or had not been doing this longer. You looked to the network uh, and built upon the strengths of others. Um, and, and I additionally want to say, I think it was so smart of you to pilot it at first, not to commit to, I think that sometimes we suffer from a, a sense of, gosh, if we do this, we're going to have to do it forever. And instead you, you piloted it, you experimented with it, you saw what worked, what didn't work, what tweaks you needed to make before you committed to doing it over uh, an extended period of time. And I think those are just really great principles for others to build upon if they are considering a ministry like this. One of the things I'd like to say to that, Jason, is before doing this, Grace had not really done any kind of big outreach at all. I mean, we basically had done a yearly fish fry, which happened one day a year, um, but and a few other things that kind of happened according to the, I don't know, like during Halloween and, and the fall, we would have a pumpkin patch, but to have a weekly ongoing missional outreach, outreach opportunity to our, our community, this had never been done before. Um, but our church was ready for it. And um, the people of Grace just wanted to find a meaningful way to help the community. This little church is a beacon in this community. It's one of the oldest churches in all of Alvin. It's a beautiful church um, and it has been a source of, of light and um, beauty for this town for a long time. Just the members of our church had never really on an ongoing basis reached out and helped the community in this kind of way. So this was a big undertaking for our little church. I mean, our ASA is 85 and, you know, we're feeding thousands of people every week. How in the world do you do that? And so for Ed and I, it was without a doubt, the most important thing was to partner with other people because we knew that our little church with her members couldn't do this and sustain this on a weekly basis. We had to enlist other people to help. And we are now working with a volunteer force of over 50 people every single week who are not even members of Grace. I would say maybe 20 people are members of Grace, but the other 30 to 35 people are just people who have heard about the good work and want to be a part of it because they're in the Alvin community. It's been amazing the people God has sent to us to help with this endeavor. And every week it's like, oh gosh, I hope we're going to have people, you know, to come and help. And without a doubt, you know, people show up and people want to serve from little kids to elderly folks. 
we had a batch of Mormon missionaries who were faithfully here every week. Um, you know, it's really cool. You just say thank you. You know, you accept everybody and put them to work because we're all there for the same purpose. But it, you know, serving and doing this kind of ministry, it bonds you to people in an incredible way. That's been one of the most surprising things for me when you're when you're working and serving alongside people, just the bond that is formed. And um, it's really neat when the same volunteers begin to show up week after week because they're feeling so fulfilled, especially in this time when we can't gather in a church. Our little parking lot has become a church in many ways. Wow, that's that's a beautiful image. Um, that's so lovely. And I mean, I love that you've started with, you saw the need of food insecurity in Alvin and you started there. Um, and you've really, as you, I think one of you said in, um, when we were gathering for the stewardship cohort that you really considered Alvin to be a steward of the community. And, and that's really, really shining. Um, you're, be you're beautifully stewarding the resources. Um, of Alvin and of Grace. I mean, like you said that you are a limited number, but your, your, your reach goes so much more and what a beautiful picture of the kingdom of heaven and, and, and little Alvin, Texas. Um, that's great. It's kind of like the saying from the movie, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. We have seen that over and over every week. It's just been magnificent how God has just brought not only guests, you know, to come and receive food, but also the volunteers, who have given so many man hours to make it possible um, because a little parish can't do it on its own. We've needed the help of our community and the community has come out in a big way. We're waiting for Nolan Ryan to show up. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, the most famous. Uh, yeah, it's I... one right here. Uh -huh. Awesome. <laughs> I, I love the fact that, I mean, there's actually some wisdom in your approach from an evangelistic perspective. Uh, you're not in a position where uh, you have all the goods to offer and you hope that others just need you. You actually went into this recognizing you needed your neighbors. You needed to, the, the relationship. There was, um, there was, there was a, um, um, uh, the, I'm, the word I'm, I'm wanting to use is escaping me at the moment, but there was there's some reciprocity is between you and the neighbors, the community in doing this work. But it also points to one of the things I always talk to the church planters and, and, and others about evangelism is what we are going to tend to connect with our neighbors in one of three ways that it's either going to be because they are looking for a Christian community that they can align with. And so they have already that kind of embedded sense of what the gospel is and, and, and who Jesus is, or they're just in need of relationship. They want to be in a community that uh, they are seen and they can participate in, or they really are interested in doing the goodwill of the community. They want to participate in and serving others and taking care of their neighbors. And the other things may not be there for them yet, but they are interested in that. And you guys, you guys saw that. You provided opportunity for people to engage to bring their sense of civic duty or responsibility or sense of charity to uh, serve others and said yes to them. Like we, we, we will accept you as you are if you want to participate with us in that way. Um, and what, realizing that, that, that we can lean in one of those three ways and find an opportunity to partner with our neighbors and, and, um, and, and announce the good news in one of those three different um, aspects is really important. And I love the fact that you found a way to do that. You've held out an open hand. You, you recognize at the get out that you, you need the neighbor as much as they need you and have gone about this in ways that has been really fruitful because of that. Uh, it's, 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 a really, it's really exciting. Thank you. Yeah. One of the things that's really important to us at Grace is our sense of gracious hospitality and radical hospitality. And so anytime anyone steps, steps foot on our campus, we want to offer and extend that. And I think that's the reason why we see so many people coming back week after week. And in fact, um, the setup for an event like this, it, it takes a while to get things going. And um, those folks who are the first in line no longer sit in their cars and watch Ed and the people of Grace set up. Guess what? They're a part of setup now. 
they want to help and they get out of their cars and they bring our banana boxes out the tables and the chairs it's just part of their um gift now you know they're getting food but they're also wanting to help and they recognize you know this is a big deal and it takes a lot of hands and hearts to make it happen every week and they're no longer sitting in their cars they are right there with us as we do the setup which I think is really remarkable. Ed, do you have anything else to say about that part of it? Well, you mentioned banana boxes, okay? So if you can imagine if we're serving like 400 people and we're giving them about 35 pounds of food, you need some big boxes. And so we've actually, um, can I give a plug or, or should I be generic? You are welcome to give a plug, go for it. <laughs> so we developed an, a really nice relationship um, with the with the Kroger grocery store here in Alvin. And there's a lot of great stories behind that, but they have an area in their back stock room area where they where they have the boxes reserved for us. And rather than crushing them down, they keep all the large boxes. And we have a, a small army of volunteers that that go to Kroger every single day and uh, pick up those boxes, primarily the big banana boxes, and bring them into our parish hall. So our parish hall is now a giant <laughs> storeroom. Um, since it's not being used for chance, and you know, we, we have you know, 400 giant boxes in our parish hall, along with all of our tables and all the other things that we need. Amazing. So I want to... Um... I'm not sure exactly how I want to ask this last question for you all, but we know that in your county, there are cases that are increasing. And so uh, there's this sense of the, of the coronavirus. And so recognizing that, how are you thinking about short and long-term adaptations to your ministry, not just uh, the food, the mobile food pantry, but also with the congregation? Um, what, to, in, in remaining vigilant and thinking about what lies ahead of us in the short term and in the long term, could you just briefly share with us, what are you thinking about as far as the adaptations to your ministry that need to be made right now? Ed, what do you think? Well, I'll back up a little bit. Um, we've, we had to implement some things that were, uh, were originally CDC requirements that they used to be mandated for all we had a specialist of monitors to take every volunteer structure and it's and so it's retained in the event that someone uh, who volunteered on any particular day um, does develop the, the virus so we're able to then contact all the volunteers and let them know that they need to get uh, be tested uh, secondarily uh, out on the parking lot, um, we, we try. Sometimes, sometimes uh, we you know, it gets pretty busy, but we do strive to try and maintain social distancing. So we we tape off an X mark. Uh, we set all those tables, and then we put an X mark where each person is going to work at their uh, at their workstation as they're uh, bagging up all these goods. And then you have the groups that come through the the individuals that come that are that are, uh, that are packers. Let's say that they they go through the line with with wheelbarrows or or, or four wheel dollies or whatever with boxes, and they and they uh, they load the boxes. And so those all have to be they you know that that space themselves out. So there's the constant um, uh, desire to try and maintain the social distancing. Everybody has to wear gloves. Everybody has to wear masks. We have hand sanitizer. We ask people to change their gloves and wash or sanitize hands freely throughout. Um, so how that, that translates um, once we come in back into the church is, you know, we've reached out to the fire marshal to make sure that we have the correct um, capacity of both the sanctuary and the um, and the parish hall itself, so that when we make the calculations of how many people we can bring back in time, we'll do all our, all our uh, the piece that my bony rear end is not going to be very appreciative of that. 
Um, but that's that's to enable us to be, to be able to to better um, sanitize um, before and after services. Um, and then uh, we'll be able to, you know, have ushers available when when we do start back and 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 lead people to where designated seat, seating areas will be. And and you know the I think the biggest thing is that um, this requires a lot of people, whether it's outside doing uh, this this uh, outreach missional type work. Uh, you know, we went from having about 12 to 20 volunteers every week to having 50 volunteers. So this will also, when we come back, we can't just leave leave this to to like two or three people uh, greeting people when they come in. You have to you're gonna have to have a, a small little army to be escorting people to the pews and um, you know greeting people at, at the entrance be, and then you know spacing them out as they come through and you know trying to maintain all the the distancing and it also requires a ton of communication we're going to have to over communicate because in our congregation we have people for instance that don't turn on a computer you know so how do we communicate with them you know we have a little team of of people who actually they they get the communication and they turn around and they dial a telephone and call the person and communicate That's great. what's what's going on to those people so that we can communicate communicate and communicate I think those are, again, really great principles to build on. Delegation, administration, um, and give, giving everybody something to do. And I think that that is going to be well received by people that are eager to get involved and have something to do. But then that communication, that commitment to ensuring that everybody has, has heard and is included in the communication, so important. Thanks to both of you for your ministry and for taking time out today to talk with us. We are really grateful for you doing this. Um, uh, we also want to remind everybody that next week, the Reverend Stacy Stringer is going to be on with us to talk further about this whole subject about community partnerships that we've brought into the conversation today. We're going to talk even more about that next time. Uh, so hopefully you'll tune in next week. Stephanie? Yeah, so our final reminders, always follow the CDC guidelines, follow your bishop's direction, and when in doubt, do no harm when do, attempting to get, do good. Notes, links, and further reflection questions are from this conversation and the previous ones are all available at epicenter.org slash virtual dash church. And like, comment, and share this conversation with your church community and, uh, and your friends if you found it helpful. So we'll see you all next week. Thank you, friends. Aww. Take care.